In 1827, a French explorer, Captain Auguste Bernard Duho Silly, encountered San Diego, and except for the port on the bay, he was greatly underwhelmed. Of all the places we visited since our coming to California, excepting San Pedro, the Presidio at San Diego is the saddest. It is built upon the slope of a barren hill and has no regular form. It is a collection of houses, all the more gloomy because of the dark color of the bricks roughly made, of which they are built. Under the Presidio, on a sandy plain, are seen 30 or 40 scattered houses of poor appearance and a few gardens badly cultivated. Hi everyone, welcome to History San Diego. I'm George Farrar. That sandy plain referenced by the captain, we know of today as Old Town San Diego State Historic Park, within the sprawling, vibrant, mighty 21st century metropolis in county we know of, live in, and thrive in today. Old Town is next. As the missions were secularized, the labor of the natives scattered and the Presidio began to fall into ruins, San Diego would get a second life as a Pueblo of the nation of Mexico. We have to ask the natural questions, why, and how did they do it? Let's look year by year with our timeline. On August 24, 1821, Mexico achieved independence from the Empire of Spain. During the decade, 1820 to 1830, San Diego reached a population exceeding 400 people. In the late 1820s, Jose Antonio Estudio, along with other former and current military officers, constructs an adobe home, which his home still stands today in Old Town. Also at this time, the Mexican governor will live in and the assembly will meet in San Diego. From 1830 to 1835, in that time range, San Diego reached a population exceeding 500 people. In 1834, the people of San Diego petitioned the government of Mexico to become a Pueblo. The Ijar colonists arrived from Mexico, named after one of the leaders from Mexico, Jose Maria de Ijar. He was to have been a Mexican California governor but Mexican President Farias was deposed by Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana as power in Mexico was increasingly centralized. So the existing governor expelled him from the area. The Ijar colonists will live throughout Mexican California, including in San Diego. In December 1834, the Pueblo elections were held for the position of El Calde, essentially the mayor of the Pueblo, and the Ayuntamiento, the council of the Pueblo. And so, on January 1st, 1835, San Diego officially becomes Pueblo de San Diego in the Republic of Mexico. The first alcalde, Juan Maria Osuna, takes office, and the Presidio eventually disbands. But by 1836, Mexico is at war with the eastern province of Texas. During the period 1836 to 1842, raids on the Pueblo by Native Americans result in the theft of cattle and hostage taking. And they're met by the Mexican government with a military operation, followed by executions. So the violence accelerates. So as a result, the numbers of people living in the Pueblo drop below 500, and in time, San Diego loses official Pueblo status. In the early 1840s, merchant and captain Henry Fitch mapped out the Pueblo lands based on the way things were at the time, and he would include the Spanish colonial lands in his survey. In April 1846 to February 1848, the Mexican-American War is fought between the increasingly westward-expanding United States against Mexico. The United States won. 
U.S. forces enter California and ultimately San Diego proper. In December 1846, after the Battle of San Pasqual, the Americans take San Diego. The Mormon Battalion, a U.S. Army unit composed of Mormons, arrives from Iowa into San Diego on January 29, 1847. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo sets most of the boundaries of the southwestern border of the United States, not including the later Gadsden Purchase. The United States agrees to honor the previous land grants bestowed by the Mexican and Spanish governments, and a process is set up for claims to be reviewed and approved or denied based upon legal evidence and mapping. Gold is also discovered during the construction of Sutter's Mill in Northern California. In 1849, the California legislature convened for the first time as California approaches statehood. In 1850, the California legislature grants the incorporation of San Diego as a city and county seat of San Diego County on March 27, 1850. Two years later, the city goes bankrupt and is ministered by a board of trustees until the 1889 charter is implemented. After President Millard Fillmore signs most of the implementation of the provisions of the Compromise of 1850 as passed by Congress, California is formally admitted to the Union as a free state on September 9, 1850. The President will later sign the Fugitive Slave Act. In 1869, the attorney of the city of San Diego presented to the Surveyor General of the state of California in court the Fitch maps. These were the maps that were drawn up by Captain Henry Fitch. There had been a dispute between Fitch and Santiago Arguello about the way the maps were drawn up and whether there was uh, enough common land around the Mission Dam. Uh, Santiago Arguello, uh, he had a lot of holding, not only in Mission Valley, but he also was sold land. Uh, the old San Diego uh, de Acala Mission lands, the ex-Mission lands, he was sold them by then governor, Mexican governor Pio Pico. And so there was a dispute in court. A deposition was taken in the 1850s. So all of this evidence over the years, all of this mapping was bundled up and presented in court. And so then in 1874, a land patent is, is issued for the Pueblo lands totaling over 40,000 acres to be conveyed to the Board of Trustees acting on behalf of the city of San Diego. And it won't be until the 1930s into later into the 20th century that the lands will be massively leased or sold off. I've now presented you with a timeline. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. How did San Diego ultimately rise as a Pueblo, only to be officially a Pueblo for around just three years, but then carry on through a war between two powers with low population and surrounded by native unrest. To survive all of that and to have a city created by 1850 is quite an accomplishment, but how did it happen? In the late 1820s, San Diego was fortunate to be a favorite home of a powerful man, Jose Maria de Echandia, who didn't much care for the fog and cold weather of Northern California. He enjoyed the sun, the warmth, and the clear weather offered in Southern California. And he just happened to be the liberal Mexican governor of California at the height of the early years of the Mexican Republic. And so in those days, the assembly met where the governor was. He would enforce the laws that would enable the education of the youth. These days, we call the laws he would enforce truancy laws. It was about building the Mexican Republic in those days. 
In later years, though, the power dynamics would shift. They would shift north, led by Governor Jose Figueroa. And so year by year, San Diego, despite the efforts of the Dons of San Diego, which we'll talk about in a moment, they would have less and less political power at the regional level. To best understand what was going on, we have to know more about the Dons of San Diego. There were some illustrious characters, personalities that would strive for political power and were constantly agitating in the Southern California regional area. So their base of operations would be out of San Diego and they would ride up and down on horses all around Southern California, rallying the people. The one thing that can be said, even though one would say some of these people were opportunists, looking out to feather their own nest at the expense of others, one thing that they had in commonality and one thing you could look back with fondness at them was their craving for local control. Mexico City was a long ways away. Even Los Angeles was a long ways away. It took forever to get anywhere. There were no freeways. There were no really good communication systems. You just got on your horse and galloped to where you were going. Okay. So you had people like Pio Pico. He ended up being a Mexican of governor of California for a couple times. He was actually the last Mexican governor of California right as the Americans were sweeping in. Don Juan Bandini was constantly agitating around uh, trying to get various Mexican governors overthrown. Again, trying to build a base of power in the Southern California region. Uh, there were some adventures they had in Los Angeles and all over California. And it's fascinating reading. And then, of course, there was Jose Antonio Estudio. Now, he would be the alcalde as the native unrest was reaching uh, its peak. Uh, and you can only imagine the stress the man was under. He built this adobe home. He had been in the military. A lot of these people in what we know of as Old Town, if you walk around Old Town, San Diego State Historic Park. When you walk around, a lot of the homes that survived and, and the ones that fell into ruins when they built the freeway, okay? These homes, a lot of these places were lived in by retired military officers. So these were, you could say war buddies, military buddies, people that worked together uh, ultimately, and which made for an interesting dynamic. Jose Antonio Estudio is interesting because ultimately he becomes the first county assessor of San Diego County. So he actually is able to transcend from the Mexican government administration into an American government administration of the county. I find that to be incredibly fascinating. These people were survivors. To have been out on this land, you had to survive. Now, how did they get the numbers up, basically? Okay, that's what we're talking about. The, the dynamic in San Diego at this time, in the Pueblo years and after, is strength in numbers. And so as there were more people, things were more successful. As there were fewer people, things were less successful, though things were accomplished. So you would have colonists come in from Mexico, the Ihar colonists. And these people, unfortunately, were not self-sufficient to the degree that they really needed to be. The entire base of the population needed people that could grow food, uh, that could really cultivate the land. And unfortunately, a number of the colonists had talents and skills in things like being a jeweler, or being a blacksmith, or 
uh, people that that had occupations and skills, unfortunately, that were not necessarily purely agricultural in nature. So you would have a base of people that ultimately, once things got tough, would have to leave. There were these sprawling ranchos that had been granted by the Spanish and Mexican governments over the years that surrounded the outskirts of San Diego. But it's important to remember, though, that even with the ranchos out there with uh, a lot of times a labor force, uh, farms, and some levels of safety, the entire area was ultimately surrounded by the Kumyi, the Native American people. So there were ranchos, and there was the Pueblo, and there were trails. But if people got off the trail, or if there were incursions by the natives, then uh, death and destruction would result. So as the years went by, as the mission system fell away, as certain conditions happened, there were raids to take cattle, to send a message, because ultimately these people were settlers on native land. Okay, we talk about the Pueblo lands, we talk about the settlers, and we talk about these Ihar colonists that brought the numbers up to a base where you could have a Pueblo. You had these people, but just as, even as far back as 1542, these lands were native. These people were not native to the land. And so they would still have an unfamiliarity with things and they wouldn't go off the beaten path. And so how can you grow if you don't necessarily at some point get off the beaten path? So the natives gained in strength. There was a botched Mexican military operation where the Mexican government sent in the military to rescue hostages that had been taken. And uh, it was bloody, uh, it was nasty. And uh, there were attacks not just on the Pueblo, but on the ranchos, okay? And so by the early 1840s, there were fewer and fewer people. And the few hardy people who survive will keep the dream alive. The stirrings of local self-determination made possible by Mexico the elections for El Calde and Uyuntimento did not get wiped out. The work of those people, when they held their positions, would ultimately carry forward through the grants they made, through th some of the things that they did, so that when along came the Americans who brought along with them the United States Constitution, land rights, and a court system, they had something to reference per the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, even bringing forward the initial claims of the Empire of Spain after they landed in 1769 and began to form the mission system with Junipero Serra. They even documented, the Americans even documented the land grants and deeds that to this day can be viewed on the city clerk's website. When I look at everything, Okay, when I look at Pio Pico, and I look at Don Juan Bandini, and I look at Henry Fitch, and I look at the colonists that came in, along with the, the original settlers, the military officers from the Presidio as it fell. I mean, these people were in a state of flux, okay? There was no certainty, right? You from day to day, what was going to happen, okay? They had about two solid years of the Pueblo before a lot of the troubles began. But who is it that we can look at and see who survived and who actually was able to carry forward an impact? I would argue Captain Henry D. Fitch, because his mapping in the 1840s, despite all the native unrest that was going on, despite all of the things that were happening, he chose to go out there and map 
and survey and put down into record in records ultimately approved by the last Mexican governor of California, Pio Pico, the mapping that would secure the claims not only of what the Mexicans inherited through the Spanish colonial mapping, but also what they claimed were the lands of the Pueblo, over 40,000 acres of land. And because he took the time and the effort and the work to do this, when everything was set up after all the court cases and the dispute with, with uh, Santiago Arguello over the rights around the Mission Dam and the commonalities that people could hold, it's his work that enabled property rights and land rights to go forward and for the fledgling, still fledgling, city of San Diego in the 1850s, 1860s, going to the 1870s, going from old town to building new town, out on the bay, the port building, and all the things that we're going to talk about season after season on History San Diego. All this has to come from that. There'd be the initial sell-offs of the initial land and then the protections put in force, put in force by the California legislature and public election, public auction, so that things didn't get out of control with speculation and uh, that was originally happening when they first, when it first hit after the course decided. Now, the growth and the capability of San Diego, which inspired me to move here in 2019, because year after year, time keeps slipping on slipping into the future. Um, it's something, it's something to behold because you see a city year by year that with such a humble beginning reached and reaches such greatness. So it's something you can look back in history and you can value and you can, you can think about and you can marvel at, at the strength and survival amidst adversity. Finally, there's something so beautiful about the American way, past and present, that the work of the people enabled the bursting forth of these productive lands from practically nothing in the late 1820s to where there is everything in 2023. And for that, I, baldly speaking for myself and over 3 million people in San Diego County, I say I'm grateful for the survival and determination of the California settlers and the diligence and productivity of the arriving American settlers. And so today, I can simply declare I'm proud to be an American. Thanks for watching History San Diego. I would now like to invite you to join us on Facebook groups at History San Diego and History California. As always, the best is yet to come on History San Diego here on YouTube. I'll be resuming our History San Diego shows later on in January 2024. And I'm so excited to have had this opportunity to bring with you, to you, this show about the humble beginnings of a little Pueblo called San Diego. Thanks for watching. Take it easy. See you later.